Hello, and thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Yvonne Valencourt, and um, I am the director of the Nantucket Field Station. We are a facility of UMass Boston. We're managed by the School for the um, Environment, and we sit on over 100 acres on Nantucket Island, owned by the Nantucket Conservation Foundation. We support educators and researchers, and they do not have to be from the UMass system to use our facilities. Uh, we have many people from different agencies, universities, institutions, and other people that do work on Nantucket that align with our mission. Um, we are streaming live. I am streaming from the Nantucket Field Station. And um, those of you watching are on YouTube, feel free to comment or question using the top chat box. You will need to log in to um, Gmail or Google in order to do that though. So please do that if you haven't. And that way you can send us messages and comments. We will get to them at the end, but feel free to do it as we go along. Um, it is my pleasure this evening to introduce Alice Palmer. Alice comes um, from UMass Boston, from Brooke Moyers Lab in the biology department. And the Moyers Lab um, works with plants. They're very interested in the variation in traits of plants and how that um, applies to problem solving and regarding things like food production, um, or species conservation. And it is my pleasure this evening um, to introduce Alice to you. And so Alice, feel free to take the floor and introduce yourself and share your slides. Hi everyone, thank you for so much for coming. And I'm excited to have the opportunity to talk a little bit about my research with you tonight. So I'm going to share my slides, um, which I guess, can you see them, Yvonne? Yes. Okay, awesome. So tonight I'm going to talk about phytoremediation and Salicornia depressa, the salt marsh plant that I study, and how it's a potential tool for protecting and cleaning up salt marshes. I'm going to start out by introducing phytoremediation and talking about some case studies of phytoremediation being effectively used in the past. Then I'm going to talk about how salicornia can be used for phytoremediation, the research project I'm working on now, and my plans for future work in this system. Bioremediation is the use of living organisms to clean up pollution from the environment. And it's a mechanism that's been gaining a lot of interest in recent decades because compared to conventional methods of contaminant removal, such as excavating and removing soil or treating it with chemicals, it tends to be less technically difficult, less expensive, and a much less invasive intrusive process. Instead of destroying all the vegetation present at a site, removing the soil, and then replanting, you can add the remediator organism and allow the ecosystem to go on functioning as the contaminants are removed. A number of different organisms are potential bioremediators, including bacteria, fungi, and plants. And bioremediation by plants is known as phytoremediation. There are also a, different, a few different mechanisms of bioremediation, including stabilization, in which the toxins remain present at the original site and the organism instead stabilizes them in place. For instance, plant roots holding contaminants in the soil and they stay on site, but they're prevented from moving further through the soil or into a watershed, for instance. Accumulation, in which the organism accumulates the contaminants in its own tissue, making it easier for them to be later removed. And metabolism, when the organism converts the toxins from a more dangerous form to a less dangerous form. I'm particularly interested in phytoremediation as a tool for cleaning up salt marshes. Salt marshes are really critical ecosystems that serve a lot of important functions. They're key habitats for a huge number of marine organisms and birds, and they also buffer land sea effects, protecting the ocean from runoff from coastal areas and protecting coastal areas from the worst of ocean weather and flooding. 
However, they're also really vulnerable to pollution, even relative to other ecosystems. The tidal flooding that salt marshes experience means that if there's pollutants in the water every day when the tide comes in, the marsh receives a new dosage of toxins. And once they flow into the marsh, they tend not to flow out. This is good for the ocean, but bad for the survival of the salt marsh itself. And the saline soil found in marshes means that heavy metal pollution in particular has greater mobility through the soil. For using phytoremediation to clean up salt marshes, it makes sense to use as a remediator a salt-tolerant plant, which halophytes are, um, salt-tolerant plants are known as halophytes. And because that way you have a plant that can already survive in the harsh salt marsh conditions. And also you'd be using a native plant, which is less likely to have negative ecological consequences of potentially introducing an invasive species. Halophytes are also a particularly useful tool for phytoremediating heavy metals in particular, and that's they tend to have a really high heavy metal tolerance and ability to accumulate heavy metals, which is directly tied into their mechanism for salt tolerance. When grown in salty conditions, halophytes manage salt's toxicity to plants by drawing salty water in through their roots and then storing the sodium ions in specialized compartments that prevent the plant from having contact with the sodium ion otherwise. However, this is a non-specific mechanism and the plant will do the same thing with any positively charged metal ion in the soil, including toxic heavy metal species. I talked before about how both plants and microbes can be bioremediators, but when using plants for phytoremediation, it's also important to think about their interactions with microbes and in particular their root microbiome, which is known as the rhizosphere, because these interactions have important feedbacks for both the plant and soil microbes. Microbes play an important role in plant health. The rhizosphere provides the plants greater access to soil nutrients and protection from pathogens. And in polluted soil, if bioremediators are present in the soil and in the rhizosphere, they can reduce soil toxins, reducing stress from those toxins on the plant. And meanwhile, the plant plays a huge role in shaping which microbes are present in the root microbiome. The plant provides a greater, a better, more favorable habitat than the surrounding soil, leading to a higher concentration of microbes and also exerts pretty powerful selective pressure, determining which microbes are present in the rhizosphere and what concentrations they are relative to one another. So a lot of the research on phytoremediation so far has been contained to laboratory and greenhouse scale experiments, but tonight I wanted to highlight some instances of phytoremediation being used under field conditions and in the real world to clean up existing pollution. So my first case study is an instance of phytoremediation being used to clean up heavy metal pollution. In the early 2000s, the Army Corps of Engineers found that homes in Spring Valley, Washington, D.C. had relatively high soil arsenic contamination from World War I era military testing. At the sites with the highest levels of arsenic, where soil arsenic concentrations were above 200 milligrams per kilogram, they removed and replaced the soil that was there. But at homes where it was 20 milligrams per kilogram or less lower, they gave homeowners the choice between soil removal and toxin removal by phytoremediation. And about 20 properties chose phytoremediation. So in order to clean up the arsenic at those properties, they planted ferns from the genus Terrace, which are known commonly as break ferns and then commercially known for phytoremediation as the Eden fern. The ferns were planted and had a growing season of five months per year. So at the end of the growing season, they were harvested and the arsenic containing ferns were removed. Well, that was confusing. The ferns, which contained the arsenic, which was all of the ferns there, <laughs> um, were removed. So at some properties, one year of doing this was enough to lower the arsenic to safe levels and yeah, all of the properties had safe soil arsenic levels within five years. Phytoremediation is also used to clean up petroleum pollution. For instance, an accidental oil skip spill at an oil production company in Pakistan. 
The researchers here used two types of grass, Leptocloa fusca and Brachiaria mutica, as well as microbes that were intended to help the grass grow and be healthy under the um, negative impact of the petroleum on the plants. And they grew plots with both the grasses alone, the, the microbes alone, and the grass and microbes together on the area where the oil spill had occurred for three months. And they found that after, at the end of the three months, the most effective treatment was the grasses and microbes grown together. And this treatment was successful in removing 78 to 85% of the oil present at the beginning of the spill. And meanwhile, in the control plot, there had only been a 12% decrease in the oil. And finally, phytoremediation is also being used to clean up pollution from hazardous chemicals and pharmaceutical waste. For instance, phytoremediation was used at a Silicon Valley Superfund site that had been contaminated with trichloroethylene, an industrial solvent. In order to clean up the trichloroethylene, researchers used poplar trees inoculated with helper microbes and grew the trees for a period of three years. They found that at the end of the three years, groundwater upstream of the poplars had a TCE concentration of 300 milligrams per micrograms per liter and a downstream concentration of five micrograms per liter, suggesting that the trees were successful in removing the vast majority of the TCE from the watershed. So with that, I'm going to move on more specifically to the plant that I study, Salicormia, and its role in phytoremediation. Salicornia is a genus of small succulent halophytes found in salt marshes around the world, everywhere in the dashed lines on this map. And as you can see from the photos, they're very pretty, and there's a fair degree of diversity in their appearance in the different species. In New England, we have three species of Salicornia. Salicornia depressa, the one that I focus on, which is an annual plant and is widespread and commonly found. Salicornia bigelovii, which is a smaller dwarfed plant, and like Salicornia depressa, an annual, but unlike Salicornia depressa, is pretty rare around here. I've never actually successfully found it, but it's here somewhere. And finally, Sarcocornia perennis, which was formerly known as Salicornia ambigua. There is a lot of current revision going on in the Salicornia and Sarcocornia taxonomy. They're sister genuses. And it's a perennial and it roots from nodes, so it grows in these huge clumps and is, I'd say, moderately widespread relative to Salicornia depressa, not quite as common. Salicornia depressa has a widespread distribution across the Atlantic, Pacific, and Gulf coasts of the U.S. and then up into Canada. And as you can see in the map on the right, is found pretty much everywhere in New England as well. Salicornia has a long history of human use. One of its common names is glasswort because in the Middle Ages it was used as, as a source of soda ash for glass making. But most of its common names have to do with food because it's an edible plant. It's known as pickleweed, sea beans, sea asparagus. There has um, been some interest in regions of the world where freshwater is scarce in growing salicornia as an agricultural commodity for human and animal consumption because you can water it with seawater. And then as you can see on the right, there's a lot of fancy recipes, including salicornia. And you can get it here. It's mostly wild foraged, but it's served at some fancy restaurants in Boston, I believe. However, I'm mostly interested in salicornia as it pertains to phytoremediation. As I said before, halophytes tend to be great at accumulating and tolerating high levels of heavy metals. And salicornia has really high tolerance and accumulation relative even to other halophytes. Previous studies have shown that it accumulates high levels of nickel, cadmium, arsenic, vanadium, lead, copper, and zinc. And it's probable that there are other heavy metals it accumulates as well that we just haven't studied yet. Overall, salicornia tolerates levels of soil contaminants that are hundreds or thousands of times higher than the safe level consider than what's considered a safe level for that metal in the soil. And it accumulates hundreds and thousands of times higher levels concentrations in its tissue than relative to the concentration in the soil. <laughs> 
At a certain threshold, salicornia does reach the limits of its tolerance for heavy metals and they start to have a negative impact on the plant, re resulting in less chlorophyll and more antioxidants that are produced to fight the toxic effects of the heavy metals. However, this threshold is extremely high relative to what's considered a safe level to have present in the soil for people or for conservation. There's been less research on salicornia as a phytoremediator of petroleum. However, the studies that I have found suggest that it tolerates relatively high soil concentration of petroleum, both light crude oil and heavy crude oil, and that even within a relatively short time frame, it will accumulate a moderate amount of what was present in the soil in its own tissue. For instance, both of these studies took place over a period of two to four weeks and found that the salicornia accumulated a concentration about half of what was present in the soil. At the limits of its tolerance for petroleum, as with heavy metals, salicornia will start to have negative health effects such as poor growth and chlorosis. But again, it's able to survive quite a bit of pollutants in the soil before it starts to impact the health of the plant. So my project is focused on Salicornia depressa, the most common of the New England Salicornia species, and what it's, the role that it plays in its natural ecosystem. I, for this project, I have three general goals or questions that I want to answer. I'm interested in the genetics of Salicornia depressa, specifically how much diversity is present in the New England populations and how that diversity is arranged. So what I mean by that is I want to know whether all of the Salicornia depressa populations that I sample act as one large interbreeding population. Do the Salicornia up in Newburyport, are they sharing genes with the Salicornia on Cape Cod, on Nantucket, in Rhode Island? Or are there smaller populations that share genes within each other but don't interbreed as much with Salicornia outside of that population? And if there are smaller populations, how are they arranged? Is it just that Salicornia are more likely to breed with Salicornia relatively close to them geographically than those that are far away? Or are there physical barriers north and south of the Cape or mainland versus the islands? Or are there environmental factors? Are Salicornia le at less polluted sites less likely to breed with Salicornia at heavily polluted sites than they are at other less polluted sites? I'm also interested in patterns of diversity among the microbes of Salicornia's rhizosphere. Which microbes are present in the rhizosphere and why are they driven by different genotypes of Salicornia, different genetic backgrounds of Salicornia selecting for particular microbes? Are they determined by environmental factors such as contaminant level or saltiness selecting for particular microbes? And then I'm interested in whether or not there are any bioremediators that might be helping Salicornia um, as a phytoremediator working together to clean up the toxins. And finally, I'm interested in how effective Salicornia depressa is as a phytoremediator growing in nature. And for that question, I want to know which pollutants are present in New England salt marshes and how much of that pollution is Salicornia depressa accumulating? How effective is it at cleaning up that pollution? So to answer these questions, I've been collecting samples of Salicornia above ground tissue, root tissue, and soil at salt marshes around the New England coast. The sites in blue are places that I went in 2019. The sites in green are sites that I went to in 2020. There, as you can see, there's many fewer and three guesses as to why. And the sites in red are places that I'd like to go in the future. In particular, I'd like to sample more around Boston, up on the North Shore and into Maine and then down up, out along the Cape. But in 2019, I was lucky enough to be able to go to Nantucket and sample two marshes there. The Creeks, which is closer to downtown, and Folgers Marsh, which is right at the Nantucket Field Station. And one of the things I'd like to do with my sampling is to achieve not just a geographic diversity of places, but also a diversity in terms of pollution level present in the soil.
Predicting in advance where high pollution sites and low pollution sites are going to be is tricky because as you can see from the map, there's a lot of sources of pollution in Massachusetts, a lot of different ones, it's very complicated. But in terms of finding a low pollution site, you can see Nantucket has many fewer sources of pollution than the mainland. And I'm hoping therefore that Nantucket and Folgers Marsh in particular could serve as a sort of low pollution baseline. So I can use the data from the salicornia and soil collected there to compare to more heavily polluted sites because Folgers Marsh is a pristine marsh that's been maintained for a long time and compared to mainland sites is less exposed to pollutants, I'm thinking. In order to test that, that's where the soil sampling comes in. So here I am at Folgers Marsh with my big bag of dirt collected there. And um, what I do for soil sampling, my assistants and I were collecting soil from um, three to five samples per site, which amounts to one sample per every 10 plants that we collect. And we're using X-ray fluorescence to quantify the heavy metals that are present, which heavy metals are present and what concentrations they have, and gas chromatography to identify which petroleum and other organic compounds might be present in the soil. And from these data, we want to get a sense for what contaminant levels are at each site and what types of contaminants are present. I'm also collecting 30 to 50 plant samples per site. The, so you can see from this, the salicornia plants are pretty small. That's like a typically sized one. And from each plant, I collect two samples that fit in these little tubes. So a relatively small amount of tissue. One of the samples we're using for x-ray fluorescence to quantify the level of heavy metals present in the plant. And then we're going to compare that to what was in the soil to see to what extent is salicornia depressa accumulating the contaminants from the soil in its tissue. And then with the other plant sample, we're going to be doing DNA extraction and sequencing. And our goal with this is to estimate plant population structure and relatedness, or in other words, what I was saying before, estimate how much genetic diversity there is among the Salicornia depressa populations and how it's arranged in space. Finally, in order to understand the Salicornia depressa rhizosphere and how that's shaped by the plants and the environment, I'm collecting root samples from the same plants that I'm collecting for tissue and DNA. And so after you pull up a plant and give it a good shake, the soil that's still clinging to the roots is considered the rhizosphere. So we're sequencing the DNA present in that soil and using it to examine the, which microbes are present in the rhizosphere, both in terms of taxonomic diversity, which microbial species or subtypes are present, and also functional diversity, what types of metabolism and other um, functional traits do they have, what can they do. And from these data, we're hoping to get a sense of the patterns of the microbial diversity and also identify any potential remediation collaborators, species that might be able to bioremediate along with the salicornia. We'll compare patterns in the microbial data to the plant genetic diversity to see if particular genetic types of salicornia depressa are shaping particular rhizosphere communities, and then also to the site contaminants to see if the pollutants in the soil are driving what type of microbial community makeup the salicornia rhizosphere has. So with the project I'm working on now, my goal is to get a good sense for what salicornia is doing in its natural environment as a wild growing plant. But in the future, what I'd like to do is develop salicornia depressa as a phytoremediation system that site managers can use to help clean up pollution problems that they have at their salt marshes. So for this, I think it would be helpful to identify the quote unquote best salicornia depressa varieties. That is, if in my initial research, it appears that some genetic types of salicornia depressa are more effective than others at, at accumulating the pollution present at their site, then those would be the best genetic types to deploy as phytoremediators.
and I to identify potential microbial collaborators, plants, um, microbes that can remediate along with the salicornia depressa to increase the efficiency of the system that might be present at some of the sites we could potentially um, inoculate the seeds with them. And so how this system would work would be that reserve staff could seed polluted areas with salicornia depressa seeds and then allow the plants to grow over the course of the growing season. They're annuals, so the plant tissue, which by then would have accumulated the, some of the pollution, pollutants, could be harvested in the fall after they've already dropped their seeds. So it would be a self-renewing system that could be regrown for as long as was necessary to get the pollutants to a sustainable level, to an acceptable level. Um, and it's interesting to think about how this could be done potentially in concert also with other marsh plants. Salicornia, its role in the marsh on its own is it's the first phase of succession. It tends to grow on bare patches that are either disturbed by storms or newly forming areas of the marsh because it's so salt tolerant even relative to other salt marsh plants. But then it's later outcompeted by faster growing larger plants like Spartina altiniflora after it's removed enough of the salt from the soil that the other plants can live there. So it's conceivable that a system for phytoremediation could be salicornia on its own or potentially salicornia and another larger plant where the salicornia is planted first to clean up the worst of the pollutants and then later um, replaced with another larger biomass plant. But all of that is pretty far in the future. Right now, I'm working on getting data for how it exists in the ecosystem naturally and how good it is as a natural phytoremediator. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody who's helped me with this work, including in the Moyers lab, my advisor, Dr. Brooke Moyers, and the four undergraduates who are helping me with this project, Philip Stefanovic, Krishna Patel, Cameron Gray McDonald, and Sarah Chaj. And also everybody who's been helping me with site selection, permitting, and um, sampling, including on Nantucket, Yvonne Valancourt at the Nantucket Field Station, Kelly Omand and Jennifer Carberg at the Nantucket Conservation Foundation, and Emily Molden with the Nantucket Land Council. Um, here are some references for in case anyone wants to do future reading on salicordia and phytoremediation. And um, I can take any questions. That was um, really interesting. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to ask you, do you mind rolling back to the reference slide and leaving that up so that if people are wanting to note that, that they can actually um, note the references while we go over some of the questions and then we can close down the slides. Um, yeah, that's a good idea. If you don't mind that. Um, this was really interesting. Uh, we have a number of people watching from YouTube. People have not um, written in uh, questions yet. Maybe they'll, they'll come now that the talk is, has ended. Um, that was a lot of information and really interesting. I have a number of questions that are very wide in range, some just about salicornia itself. So you indicated the size of it. It's not a big plant. Um, and you know, here we're very lucky. We have a rather pristine island in many respects, although we do have some issues and spots. Um, so I do have questions about um, the things it takes up and how it stores them. There's mm -hmm. so many questions I have. So I'll let me start okay. asking them. Um, Go ahead. Time, how large does it, can they get? So one thing we um, have uh, concerns about is nutrient overload in our mm -hmm. waters. Um, so I, if there's a lot of nitrogen in the water, do the plants get much larger? And are they, is their condition or their size an indication of anything? Can they be used as an indicator just by the way they look? Um, I'd say that because salicornia, it does tend to be outcompeted by other larger and faster growing plants. 
In my experience, the size is typically an indication of biotic factors, what plants are growing around it. It gets bigger in bare patches where it can get a lot of light and it tends to be kind of, um, so it grows both in bare patches in large groups of just Salicornia depressa individuals and then also in the high marsh it will grow among Spartina patens and then in the low marsh sometimes among short form Spartina altiniflora. So when it's growing with either of the Spartinas it does tend to be smaller and sort of, um, so I can rewind a little, well, here's one. Um, so instead of having, being like largely succulent everywhere throughout the plant, it tends to have more um, tissue that's senesced to sort of a woody stem and also be less upright and more spreading, but that's more based on what's around it. Um, the largest, I'd say, in terms of the succulent tissue are maybe a foot or a foot and a half tall, and then they can get to be about six inches wide or so. Um, the, in terms of longest, though, if it's growing among taller grasses, the Spartinas, it will develop a long, like, woody stem and then just a little succulent plant at the end of it, and those can be maybe up to two feet long. In terms of nutrient pollution, I think that at a site with a lot of nutrient pollution, it's likely that the salicornia would probably just be outcompeted by other plants and probably not grow very well there. Interesting. Um, and you said it's an annual. Yes. So does it die back completely and it, it and it's gone and a new plant develops. I mean, they, we usually see them in patches here. So I, mm -hmm. how does that work from season to season? Yeah, it dies back completely. Um, the succulent tissue dries out completely and it's just like a brown woody looking stem. And then um, it will have already dropped its seeds which will then start to develop in the spring. And the, the baby salicornias, I don't have any pictures of them but in this presentation, but you guys should all go look them up because they're very cute. Um, but here the growing season, I'd say it starts around mid-March and then by about the second week of October and certainly the beginning of November, all of the plants will have died. Um, this isn't true of the sarcocornea perennis, which is a perennial. Um, so that will grow from year to year and get the get grow into these um, like giant clumps. It's called chicken claws because it does sort of look like a giant tentacled thing is coming up through the soil. <laughs> we um, we do have a couple of questions coming in. Um, so we. Okay, you mentioned three species of Salicornia in New England. Is Salicornia maritima a synonym for depressa or other? Or maybe um, Salicornia, Salicornia maritima is not a New England species? That's a really interesting question because according, so Salicornia depressa and Salicornia maritima are different species. And according to the USDA and the sort of more official sources for their distribution, we don't have Maritima in New England. It's only when you get up into the Canadian Maritimes. However, my advisor and I have been looking through photos on the iNaturalist site. And there's a lot of photos there that people identify as Salicornia depressa but they look more like Salicornia maritima, um, and these are found up in Maine. So we're planning potentially in the future investigating whether or not there is maritima in Maine. Um, one thing potentially confusing this is that the Salicornia species, especially in Europe, have a great deal of phenotypic plasticity, where organisms of the same species but growing in different environments will start to look like each other or different from members of the same species. So in Europe, the identifying part of particular species can be really confusing. Here, there are fewer species, so it should be more straightforward. But yes, there might be maritima in Maine, or it might be funky looking Salicornia depressa. Um, we have a, a question from Kelly Oman. Uh, do you have plans to return to collect more samples on Nantucket? Um, 
I'd really like to in the future, especially depending on what we find in terms of the soil and initial plant results. It might be interesting to look also at sort of longitudinal year to year data. I'd say at the moment, my priority is probably going sampling at places that I haven't been previously because in part because in 2020, I wasn't able to go to nearly as many places as I would like. But once we have our, and also um, it's difficult to say because also I haven't been able to do as many, as much sample processing and actual data gathering as I would like. And the preliminary data when we get it is going to inform where we go in the future. But I'd say yes, returning to sites that we've been previously is definitely something that we're probably going to want to do. And in particular to Nantucket because it is promising in terms of finding a site with low pollution. So um, I am always interested in things we can eat. Um, <laughs> and so I do have questions about um, this combination of topics. It's mm -hmm. really interesting to see, you know, that you can eat salicornia and that it's in recipes and in um, restaurants, but it is now, you know, a concern knowing that it can accumulate. So I, I have a couple of questions about that and there are some other questions coming in as well. So I, I won't tie you up too much with this, but um, I, I guess, it, you know, if we have a pristine environment, um, then we have less issues. Uh, although in places like Folgers Marsh, we don't, wouldn't uh, want people uh, foraging out there, but mm -hmm. maybe in other places you could. But how do people reconcile those two realities, this is a, something we eat, but it's also something that accumulates heavy metal. And um, so how do people deal with that if they're, um, you know, how do, how do they go about testing them or is it, um, is it done? Um, and then the, um, yeah. I'll... As far as I know, um, as far as I know, there isn't testing of wild forage salicornia for heavy metal levels in particular because as I've been looking into how to test salicornia for heavy metal, um, facilities that can test plant tissue, um, heavy metal levels in plant tissue are relatively rare and it's a relatively expensive process. So I don't think that's happening for people selling it at like farmer's markets and such. I think it's partly because there's not, it's not widely known that it accumulates heavy metals. Um, so I personally would be concerned um, if I were buying salicornia or even eating it at a restaurant with where it's coming from and the levels in the soil there. I'd say that if it's from an area that's known to be relative, if you're foraging it yourself and you're at an area where it's known to be relatively pristine and unpolluted, it's probably okay. The other thing is that luckily it's not something that people eat very often. So it's at least not going to be a chronic and long-term exposure to eating heavy metals. Um, but that would be, that's one thing that's good about growing salicornia in greenhouses as an agricultural commodity is then it's not getting that heavy metal exposure. And um, I am planning on trying to grow some in my, I have like a like indoor garden in my apartment where I grow like tomatoes and kale and stuff. So I'm going to try to grow some salicornia next year. It is um, very interesting, though, that, I mean, that there is, if there's a market for grown salicornia, that's something you actually could grow in salty water if you knew mm -hmm. your water was clean. That's actually pretty interesting. Um, yeah. But we do have a couple of questions. So Nicole Madden is asking for your research sites. Are there some where salicornia was planted in marshes for phytoremediation or where they occur naturally? So all, all of my sites so far have been places where salicornia is growing naturally. To my knowledge, any research, all of the research on salicornia as a potential phytoremediator has been more lab and greenhouse based. I don't think anyone has actually tried to implement salicornia as a phytoremediation system yet. Um, 
And we have um, Darcy Bird 12 is asking, very interesting what you said about salicornia's role as a pioneer plant that can tolerate and take up salt and allow uh, Spartina alterniflora or other plants to establish. Thank you. So there's a comment there. Um, Thank you. Yeah, these are, um, it's really interesting. I, I, another question I had was um, just, you know, simple, and maybe you said this and I missed it, but where does it actually accumulate um, the toxins that it, it does? Is it sequestered in one area or is it sort of throughout the entire plant? Do you know? Oh, that's definitely something I should have mentioned more. Um, so in terms of at a more cellular level, it's sequestering heavy metals in specialized vacuoles within each cell. But one thing that makes salicornia a particularly good phytoremediator of heavy metals compared to other halophytes is that most plants, halophytes included, um, do a really good job of protecting, it, it's a measure to protect themselves from metal toxicity. They keep the toxins in their root tissue rather than their above ground tissue. But that means that for phytoremediation, it can be tricky because it's a lot easier to harvest the above ground parts of a plant than to go in and pull them all up by the roots. Salicornia, on the other hand, for most heavy metals, it stores them in its above ground tissue as well as in its root tissue and in fact transports them to the above ground tissue. So it's higher in the shoot than in the root. Um, Salicornia also has very simple morphology. So I say above ground tissue, it only has stems. It doesn't have leaves. Um, so that's, I think, another reason, that's another advantage to salicornia is that if you're harvesting only what's above ground, you're getting most of the heavy metals accumulated by the plant. That makes sense. Um, how about, um, do they actually press, the, so salicornia has oil in it, am I correct? Yes, um, so that's one potential use for salicornia as a food crop, is using it as an oil seed crop rather than eating the succulent tissue. Um, salicornia, um, the oil is from the seeds, so salicornia actually has a higher concentration of oil per seed mass than other plants that are used as oil seed crops right now, like rapeseed, which is what canola oil is made from. Um, so I think that it's, well, it would be efficient. It would be kind of tricky because salicornia seeds are smaller than the head of a pin. So you would have to, they're gathering them and working with them might be tricky. But I think also in terms of using it as a salt irrigated crop, it might be easier because instead of trying to convince people to eat this vegetable that they might not be familiar with, convincing people to try a new source of cooking oil might be comparatively easier because it's not something you really taste or pay that much attention to. There's also interest in using it as a source of green salt, um, just extracting the salt from the salicornia tissue because they are so salty which is interesting because it would be a modern use of a very old technology because the soda ash in salicornia used in glass making was also just removing the salt from the salicornia to make the soda ash. Kelly Oman has um, another question. If you remove at the end of the season to, re to reduce toxins, what would you do with the removed toxic material. Is there a protocol for that in New England or is it too new of a concept? I don't know if there's a specific protocol for the removal of um, phytoremediation plants that have high levels of toxins in them. My guess would be that it would be handled the same way as when you do soil removal for toxic purposes. And I know in that case, the soil is typically stored at specialized, um, specialized sites, which obviously isn't like a perfect long-term solution, but um, is the solution that we have now and possibly better than, probably better than leaving them in situ, especially in an ecologically and conservation-wise valuable ecosystem. Do the um, seeds end up with heavy metals in them as well? Do you, you know if you're 
able to do anything with the seeds or they probably have um, contaminants or are a little screwed up if there's a lot. I don't think research has been done on this in Salicornia in particular. I think the because I don't think research has been done on this in particular in Salicornia in terms of metal translocation into the seeds. But I know that for plants that grow in polluted environments, typically um, they do a really good job of keeping heavy metals out of the fruits, for instance, um, which I think in this case would also apply to the seeds themselves within the fruit. Um, although that might not be the case, that might be because fruits um, are distributed by animals eating them. So for salicornia, which is wind and water, the seeds are spread by wind and water, there might not be selective pressure to keep the heavy metals out of the seeds. However, I'd say that um, they wouldn't accumulate to such a level that the seeds would then suffer. However, as I said before, sorry, I know I'm like a lot on, on one hand, on the other hand, but um, the research on salicornia and heavy metals does typically um, take place over one generation and not on multiple generations. So it's possible that there would be a negative impact on seeds because they're not looking so much at survival in heavily polluted areas. So I think that's one thing that's really interesting and valuable, valuable about my project is that it is looking at salicornia that's wild occurring and growing in polluted areas because if I find that there is a lot, I expect to find a lot of salicornia growing even at polluted sites, but if there's not, then it could indicate that there's something about real world polluted conditions that it can't survive as well as it can in the lab in polluted conditions. And that could be because there is an effect on seeds or perhaps on like tiny seedlings when they come up. Interesting. Um, how about, so you mentioned um, polar, um, or no, I'm sorry, I'm thinking poplar, of planting poplar trees mm -hmm. to uh, uptake um, toxins, but um, other types of contaminants. Uh, things like forever chemicals? Is there any work done on their ability to phytoremediate from groundwater, things like that, uh, PFAS and mm -hmm. that category? Um, I have seen, I'm not sure if I've seen any research on PFAS specifically. Most of the research I've seen with poplars has actually been on um, like industrial and organic compounds, including PAHs. Um, I'm, I've done less research on poplars than salicordia, of course. Um, in terms of pop, poplar and willow tend to be the species that get chosen for phytoremediation a lot because they're, they're both very fast growing trees with extensive root systems. So I think the idea is less, with salicornia, the idea would be to choose a plant that's a natural, natural at surviving and phytoremediating toxins. Whereas with willow and poplar, the idea is to choose a plant that is okay at drawing in and surviving toxins, but good at growing very quickly and developing a broad root system that can take in more toxins and store them in a larger plant. So you're sort of looking at a plant that has strengths for phytoremediation for a different reason. It's a different approach. This is so interesting. Um, I, I think we probably have left the references up there long enough. Okay, to yes. To write and so maybe they can see your, your face. Um, yeah. Or beautiful picture, but um, I think it, yeah, it'd be nice to maybe have our, our faces here. Um, and we can have the two of us uh, so that people can, can see that. Um, I'm not seeing any new comments or questions just yet, but um, I would say we're probably going to wrap this up by seven o'clock. Although okay. I could keep asking you questions. <laughs> I have a comment that sort of ties into uh, several different questions that were asked. One proposal that I've seen with salicornia that I thought was really interesting was actually using salicornia to clean up nutrient pollution in salt marshes, which um, as I, I don't know how well it would do cleaning up nutrient pollution under field conditions, but this was proposing 
using it to clean up nutrient pollution from fish farms, which are huge sources of nutrient pollution that's then dumped into the water. Because salicornia that's remediated nutrient pollution, it's not like salicornia that's remediated like lead or petroleum, where then you can't eat the salicornia. Salicornia that's just taken in a bunch of nitrogen or phosphorus is a really, it's just a larger, healthier salicornia. Um, so the paper that I read was proposing that fish farms could start a side business in which instead of dumping their effluent directly into the marsh, they had an area where they like a little salicornia farm and then sell, sell the salicornia as a food crop. So it would be an incentive to clean up the nutrient pollution because you're not only helping the environment, you're, you have like a, a side business that's making you more money. And that way salicornia can do double work as both a phytoremediator and a source of food. That's really interesting. Um, so you could, yeah, I mean, it, my other questions are about farming. I mean, do, are mm. there people farming salicornia in the U.S.? I th not that I know of in the U.S. The closest would be in Baja California in Mexico. And then I know there's interest in Israel and elsewhere in the Middle East. But I think here there's less of an incentive because we're less um, short on fresh water. But it would be, I think it would be a really cool project to start and get involved with. Yeah. Um, and then my other question was, uh, has anyone looked at any kind of interactions that um, they might have with harmful algal bloom? Um, yeah. Not that I know of. Either toxins or, or organisms, um, if they are able to take things up at all. They might be able to, yeah, I'm not sure. That would be good to know for a number of reasons, I guess. If So when they take it up, they just store um, the heavy metals. You're not going to do anything with them, but mm -hmm. larger compounds, if they're taking them up, are they just storing them or are they breaking them down? I think they're likely breaking them down over time. Um, yeah, it's interesting because I would imagine that when salicornia is growing in the natural ecosystem, it's just sort of, especially Salicornia depressa as an annual because it dies off every year. Um, I would assume that over the course of the year, it's getting a progressively higher concentration of heavy metals. And then when the plant dies, it just decomposes on site. And I assume, assume releases them back in the soil and then new Salicornia take up the same ones the next year. Um, but then in terms of organic compounds, I think it is likely that the plant is breaking them down and probably making use of them in some way. Interesting. Um, we do have another comment here. Um, Kelly Omond is asking, what parts of the main coast are you interested in? Um, in <laughs> this is the uh, overly honest methods version, but in the short term, probably the southern parts that we can drive to pretty quickly. Um, and then we're also interested, as I said, in finding out whether or not there's any Salicornia maritima up there. So we'll probably look at where these um, supposed maritima sightings have been and look up there. It's also possible I would like to get a toxin map of Maine like I have of Massachusetts because I know that Maine being so, is so much less densely populated. There might be areas there that are have historically been less developed and might have lower levels of pollution. So they might be interesting for that reason as well. Definitely. Um, so lepid, uh, Lepidoptera, right? moths and butterflies and things. Um, they feed on salicornia, right? And some, there's at least one species that I believe is obligate. Do you know if they're, if I would assume if they feed on a plant that has accumulated toxins that would travel into them as well? I would think so, yeah. It's possible, and this is just me wildly speculating, I haven't studied this at all, but it's possible that um, they have a tolerance to it as well, or, um, but I'm not really sure how that works in the food chain, or it's possible that they're ne being negatively impacted by the heavy metals and are, and it, I, 
yeah that'd be an interesting um project for somebody yeah and to see if there's any kind of um concentration as you go up terrific levels um another comment darcy bird 12 you may have talked about this but would the perennial salicornia be a better choice for bioremediation projects since it is a perennial and could the top portions be harvested um so in some ways, I think there's advantages to the perennial and advantages to the annual. One of the advantages to the annual is that you can definitely harvest the whole thing without causing harm. I would be worried that with the perennial, if you cut it back significantly enough, it could start to hurt the plant's ability to survive an overwinter. Um, I haven't, I don't know how much you can cut back before you hurt the plant. It's possible that you could cut it back pretty significantly. Um, but one advantage of using the perennial would be that because it's a perennial, it develops a more extensive root system and also greater biomass. I'm not sure also, and if we're thinking about cutting it back every year, which would accumulate more biomass in a given growing season faster though, it's possible that the annual grows faster over the course of the year than the perennial does. Well, this has been so cool. Uh, thank you very much for speaking. I, like I said, I could just <laughs> keep asking <laughs> questions. Um, and I'm looking to see if anyone else, because it seems like we've got a, a couple of people who are doing quite the same thing, um, but we probably should uh, let you close out and um, invite you back to talk when you've been able to process your samples. And maybe when this COVID situation has come to a close, we could have you in person on Nantucket. It would be great. Um, to hear more about this. And I can think of a lot of things that people here might be interested in actually doing with salicornia because we are a, a rather pristine site. And um, so we're lucky that way. Yeah. Um, have you, uh, last question, um, have you ever eaten it? Yeah, I have at one or two places where I was relatively sure that the there weren't too many soil pollutants. Um, I will say it is yummy. <laughs> um, I do like it. Um, it's like a, it is like a pickle, but very salty um, and a little less sour, I guess. Um, I would say if you're going to eat it, in like safety concerns aside, like obviously be careful about what's present in the soil, but the annual species are tastier than the perennial species because the perennial species become more fibrous and woody, so. It's good to know. Um, well, yes, you've had some thank yous, and this is great, very well spoken and awesome presentation. Um, yes, we'd love to learn more as you learn more. So thank you from me. Thank you so much for having me, and I'm really looking forward to getting to update you when I have more information. Well, we are all looking forward to that, and thanks again. This was really um, fantastic, and it's always fun to learn about things in our backyard. Um, so we look forward to, oh yes, and actually one last little question. Okay. That one species you said was very difficult to find. Um, any thoughts on, on that? And maybe we could ask you at our next talk, but I, I wondered um, if that had something to do with its life history or it's just outcompeted or, or you don't know. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't actually know. We know from the USDA and from other botanist resources and field guides and stuff that there have been reported sightings of it here. And it's like, it's officially here. But um, like I said, we haven't been able to find any. And I'm not sure if that's because the people who thought they saw it were misidentified it and we're actually seeing Salicornia depressa, which looks like small <laughs> Salicornia depressus because that would look similar or if we've been overlooking it or just not going to the right places. And it is possible that conditions have changed and it is now getting outcompeted or something else is happening. But I, yeah, I don't know why we haven't been able to find it. Interesting. Um, well, that gives us something to go searching for. True, yes. If you find some, let me know. <laughs> um, well, thank you once again. Um, this was really great and um, lots of, of uh, comments on good discussion and.
a nice presentation. So thank you very thank much. You. It was uh, great talking to you. Likewise. And um, thank you everyone who tuned in and who took the time to write into the chat box. Um, we look forward to continued solid cornea discussion. So um, with that, have a nice evening. You too.